Amen. Amen. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. They always say behind every pastor is a great woman, and I am blessed to have Erica as my wife. So um, as you guys can tell, the running joke in the sound booth as she was giving announcements was uh, she's definitely caught hold of my preaching abilities because we can get long-winded. But that's okay, because she did great, right? She did great. Yes, go Erica. So uh, awesome. You know, I just can't really put my finger on it, but I feel like, I just feel like the Spirit's really here this morning. I really feel like this morning that Jesus really does want to do a work. I really do. I, as I gave my testimony this morning, I Man, when, when I got that text, it was, I was just holding back uh, the tears of God's goodness and just how he, he really loves people. He really loves us as his children, and if you haven't placed your faith in Jesus Christ yet, I want you guys to know that he loves you. And, man, I don't know how we don't get overwhelmed or emotional, and I know I'm just, uh, that's a gift that I wish he didn't give me to cry all the time, but man, when you think about God and how much he loves us, and, and, and sending his one and only son, Jesus, to come and bore our sins, and to have a faith where he says, hey, you don't have to be perfect to come to me, come as you are, and I'm going to do the work to make you perfect. It, it overwhelms me. And this morning, we're going to reflect on, on that this morning with communion. But before we do, I, I honestly just have a very simple, short message. Some of you are probably thinking, Pastor JJ and short doesn't go together. <laughs> but I really do. Uh, I just can't shake it. I believe the Lord wants us to just be at the altar this morning. I believe the Lord wants us to honestly lay it all down. To lay it down. To let it go. I think we live in a time where, as Christians, we've really allowed the world to um, change our mindset and live as the world is living, but Jesus calls us to a higher standard. And I really believe that what God wants us to do in this community, man, we have to be shaken to the core of our inner beings. Like what God has given as a vision to Erica and I and Man, when I talk to our deacon board and, and, and Becky and Carol and Weston and Donna and Larry, really hope I'm not forgetting someone. Um, we're excited. But I also believe that as we talk that we realize that, man, we have to be a body that's on our faces before the Lord. That what God wants us to do and to love thy neighbor, love one another, to become a family, as I was talking to one of our congregants this morning, how we want to have a, a genuine atmosphere of being a family. We got to love one another. And I'm excited for that. And if you're a guest with us this morning, I mean, honestly, I just want to say thank you for for coming. I have no agendas. I have nothing to persuade you with. I have nothing to, there's nothing inside of me that says you have to stay here. I'm just excited that you've came here because I do believe what God is doing here is different than a lot of places. That doesn't mean we're, we're better than anyone else. I just believe that the Lord, uh, we're a body that really just wants Jesus to move on Sunday mornings. 
Through the Holy Spirit, I'm not going to be a pastor that says uh, he doesn't move today because he does move. And as a matter of fact, if, if any of this was weird to you to hear Chris uh, shouting out, thank you, Lord, man, Chris's testimony is uh, a testimony I've never heard of. I mean, it's, it's amazing, and, and it's a genuine love for the Lord that comes out of her. And maybe that makes some of you guys uncomfortable, but I'm telling you right now that if you read Scripture, what it's going to be like in heaven is a lot like what Chris does on Sunday mornings. Yeah, and that's not to, to single her out and say, look at Chris. Uh, it's to say, hey, be comfortable with being uncomfortable. We're not going to be a church that says, Chris, you can't praise and worship the Lord the way you want to worship the Lord. And, and obviously there's order and, and everything like that. But man, I am excited. And I believe as we go through the book of Philippians, what Paul has been doing is talking to us about joy. And I sit at the drums and I watch you guys worship and it's been amazing to see the joy in your guys' lives. But sometimes there's a Sunday uh, where maybe uh, we get that extra hour of sleep and it's maybe too much sleep for, for Sunday morning. But there's a, a Holy Spirit heaviness that I just feel this morning. And I'm not someone that just says, man, the Spirit's moving today. I'm not that guy. Because I love to preach the word of God. And sometimes I don't do it right, but I just love to preach it. But this morning, there, there's something different here this morning. I believe that God wants us to get back to the basics. Simplicity. Because a Christian faith, it's not a difficult faith. He lays it all out for us in his scriptures of how to live, of how to love, of how to worship, of how to pray, of how to agree to disagree. It really is a simple faith, but then for some reason us as human beings just get in the way and we make it really complicated. Me the most. Ask Christy. She sees it every day. Thank you. <laughs> uh, today, as we go through chapter three and start to be chapter four, uh, we're going to be wrapping up Philippians here in two weeks. Uh, next week, we will, I will not be preaching. Praise the Lord. <laughs> uh, next week, we're going to be blessed. I mean, blessed. Uh, next week, Adrian Starks from Blair is going to be coming to speak. And if you guys haven't heard Adrian, uh, man, she is anointed. She is anointed to bring the word of God, and she's told me what we're going to be talking about next week. And I, at first when she told me it's two chapters in Romans, I said, how much time do you need? Yeah. Two chapters of Romans. Uh, it's a lot of verses. Uh, but her, her topic is... Uh, Turn the page. Turn the page. And it's from Romans 7 and 8. So I want to encourage you guys this week to read Romans 7 and 8. Because it's going to show you where you stand at with the Lord if you're not born again. But it's going to show you where you're at after you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ. But it's going to be amazing. So come next week. I promise you, you won't regret it. And then after that, we have two weeks of, of Philippians where we'll end it. And then in December, we're actually going to give some people here in our congregation some chances to preach. We're going to have Weston, uh, Michaela's husband who plays piano. Uh, her husband is going to be preaching. Um, Erica, my wife, is going to preach. Uh, and then uh, I'm still looking for a third person. No. <laughs> I'm joking. But we're going to give some other people time to preach. But before we do that, I just want to pray before we get into our short message here this morning and say, Father God, we thank you and we love you and we worship you. And Holy Spirit, man, Holy Spirit, I pray that you soften our hearts to, to really give it to you, to really let it go, to really release to you to nail it at the cross. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you break through this morning and show us how much you really love us, Father God. 
Show us how much you've really forgiven us. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. So Philippians 3. Uh, if you weren't with us last week, Paul is continuing uh, where he's coming up against uh, the stuff that's about to infiltrate the Philippian church. And if you weren't with us last week, I had a ladder. Uh, some, some of you said it wasn't tall enough for me to climb, uh, but I felt like it was plenty tall. Um, I'm, I'm afraid of heights. Uh, I listed on that ladder the things that Paul said that he had pri- uh, previously before coming to Jesus as faith. And, and he, I'll just read it for you real fast. In, in Philippians 3, verse 5, he says, uh, I have more reason to be confident in the flesh. And he goes on to list his resume of, man, I've been circumcised on the eighth day. That means he is a, a full-blooded. He, not, I mean, people got circumcised on the eighth day, but he didn't come to faith or Judaism after that. It was on the eighth day he, he maintained that covenant with the Lord. And he said, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, I'm a Pharisee, as to zeal, persecutor of the church, righteousness under the law, blameless. And, and so if you weren't with us last week, Paul is pretty much saying, hey, This is about to come to your church because it's already infiltrated Ephesus. It's already gone into Corinth. It's already gone into Galatia. And I'm promising you right now that it's about to infiltrate the church of Philippi where people are going to come in and say, hey, you can follow Jesus, but first you have to become a Jew. You can follow Jesus, but first you have to to uphold the 613 laws. Or we might have to do a ceremonial uh, bath to to cleanse you. Uh, They're coming saying that Jesus sounds great, but you have to do this. And Paul's saying, hey, If you guys want to compare apples to apples, let's compare it right now. Let's compare all of you to me. And if you think that you can uh, uh, withstand my resume, then let's compare it to Jesus himself. And he pretty much says, hey, if you want to place your your faith, if you want to work your way to heaven, good luck. And that, though it's convicting, church, isn't that freeing? Like, Maybe you've grown up in a mainstream denomination, like I, and I don't mean this negatively, but I, I grew up in a, a mainstream denomination. I'm not going to say what it is, because I'm not a big fan of denominations in the first place. I think it causes div- a division right away as soon as you say, what denomination are you? But I grew up in a faith where it says, hey, you have to do this. Or because you've done this, you don't have to worry about walking out obedience. And, and as I got into a Pentecostal church and started really studying the scripture, made Jesus my Lord and Savior and really had a relationship with him, I was like, man, that's not even true. And so what Paul is saying is like, hey, this is about to come to your church, but don't listen to it. Listen to me. And that's where we pick up in chapter 3 and verse 12, because if you have your Bible, it's probably most likely saying straining toward the goal. Right? Right? And, and really what I want to say this morning to you guys is stand strong. Run the race. Pursue Jesus. When you get tired, pursue him more. When you become weary, pursue him more. When you're exhausted, pursue Jesus even more. Because if you're pursuing anything else, man, it's, it's going to fall short. And what Paul is saying in in, in verse 12, he says, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Jesus has made me his own. And and in that first opening verse of of verse 12, if you go back to chapter 3 and verse 10, he says this. This is what what Paul wants, that he knows him. Who's him? He knows Jesus. That he knows the power of Jesus' resurrection. That he may share in Jesus' sufferings. And that he may become like him in death. And that's what Paul is talking about in this verse. Not that I've already attained this or I'm already perfect. And I just want to start off by saying, church, if you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, I'm telling you right now that this is a journey type faith. Everything in this chapter from uh, verse 12 on is really Paul correlating back to the Jewish time all about their games. Running the race. And maybe some of you guys are track runners, but if you're not a track runner, I just want to say that I was a track runner. I had scholarships in college for track. I loved track. You know what I hated about track was the first couple weeks of track practice. Because there you're going to realize that this is going to be a long season. But you place goals to accomplish by the end of that season. For example, let me just share, I ran the 400. 
And in order to improve your 400 time, what you'd do is you'd run 300 meters, one after one after one after one. And what you'd do is, over the course of the season, is you'd make that time of the 300 meters shorter and shorter. So in high school, what we'd start out was maybe 40, 42 seconds, uh, depending on your speed. If you wanted to uh, run a fast 400, your goal is to get a, a certain time at 300 so that by the end of that 100 meters, you're just trucking, saying, oh God, just carry me through. And typically to start the season is you'd start at 42 seconds, 43, depending on how fast you were. Uh, but I always had it at 37 seconds. Not bragging. The Lord gifted me with being fast. 37 seconds was my goal every 300 meter practice. Over and over and over. And you'd run 20, 300 meters. Because it would carry you through. But you know what's fascinating about track and, and the fascinating thing about sports is that with that goal, you'll never accomplish it. Because as soon as you accomplish that goal, you change the goal to make it harder. And what Paul's telling this church right here is that, hey, my desire, my goal is to know Jesus more. If you were with us last week, he's talking about going from a head knowledge to heart transformation. That you can know the doctrines. You can know the theologies. You can know that Jesus actually is a man that lived on this earth. You can know that he, uh, most scholars and most historians, even atheists, don't dispute the existence of Jesus anymore. That you can know all that, but until it transforms your heart, you don't know Jesus. He says, I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know and share in his sufferings and become like him in death. And what Paul is saying is, I'm not perfect, church. I'm not perfect. I mean, think about what Paul, who Paul is. Paul, uh, most scholars believe that he wrote the vast majority of the New Testament. Most people believe that even though you read the New Testament, there's other churches that Paul actually planted on his time on this earth. So maybe 14 or 20 churches that Paul planted. At the time of writing this book to the, the church of Philippi, he's walking faithfully with the Lord for 30 years. And in that time, he had ample blessings, but a lot of persecution. He had highs, he had lows. But what he's telling the church is this, hey, I haven't made it. It's really fascinating to think that it's a journey as a faith. And as a church for us, it should let us know that if you can look to the person to your left or right and say, hey, I'm a work in progress. I'm a work in progress. Now look at someone and say, you're a work in progress. <laughs> because that one feels a lot better, doesn't it? <laughs> Paul is saying in this first verse to open it up, hey, I am literally a work in progress. And he's not afraid to say that he's not perfect. And church, I want to challenge us here this morning to, to really lay it down. You don't have to pretend that you have everything together. You don't have to walk through the front door or the back door saying, man, my life is perfect even though it's in shambles. That you don't have to look to one another and compare. I don't have to compare myself to Becky because my salvation is secured in Jesus Christ and Christ alone, not in making myself look better than Becky or her looking better than me. And that's what Paul is getting at. And that's what I want us to become as a church is that we can come in and say to one another, hey, guess what? I believe in righteousness. I believe in God and in him being a great judge. I believe in his holiness. But guess what? I'm not perfect. Maybe I've walked this faith longer than you have, but I'm still struggling. Now, the reason that people get afraid of that is because of this. He says, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. See, the faith in Jesus Christ, when you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, when you've recognized the depths of your sin, when you've recognized who you were before God came and redeemed you, you don't want to abuse his grace. That doesn't mean that we're not perfect. 
right? I mean, ask, again, ask Christy, ask my wife. I'm not perfect. But when I fall short, man, it crushes me. Because I've fallen short of God. And so I want you guys to know as a church that this does not give us the freedom to live a life of sin. It doesn't give us the freedom to say, man, I've placed my faith in Jesus Christ. I'm good to go. I'm just going to go do whatever I want. What Paul is saying is that I've, I have not obtained this. I have not obtained perfection. But I'm going to pursue it until the moment that Jesus calls me home. Church, if Paul himself has a heart of pursuing the Lord, I mean, Hall of Fame, Paul, how much more do we probably need to pursue the Lord? How much more should we desire to be in God's word and say, Father God, I don't know what's going on, going on in this world, but I know that your word has a word for every season and every time of life. May I not come to your word, Father God, and, and make it what, say what I want to say, but may I come to this word and have you change me from the inside out so that I can live victoriously and righteously and holy for you, that I can be set apart for your goodness and to glorify you and you alone. And I'm not perfect, Father God, but I believe in your forgiveness. Straining towards a goal. Paul goes on to say, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. The faith of the Christian believer church is one that exhorts itself or exerts itself fully. Straining forward. Literally in the Greek, means you're going all in. You are fully extended, reaching out, pressing on, pursuing as much as you can. Some scholars, there's, there's, some, uh, there's a little bit of friction between scholars on this. Some of them say that this word straining in the pursuit is a hunting term where you hunt after animals, that you're not going to give up until you get it. And then others that say, man, it's hard work. I believe it's more like it's hard work that he strains forward to what lies ahead, but he forgets what's behind him. And church, I just want to talk about real fast, let it go, the past. Let go of the past. Now, I know that there's people here this morning that are probably already saying, man, Pastor J.D., you don't know. You don't know what happened to me. And you're right. Some of you, I do know your story, and it's brutal. But what I also know and what I will not compromise is the power that comes through being a believer in Jesus Christ and Christ himself. And this is what I also know, that when we hold on to the past, when we hold on to the past hurts, when we hold on to things that we regretfully have done, when we hold on to things that maybe we've done in the past that um, just really holds us in the bondage, when we hold on to that, this is what I know. Number one, it's gonna fester a lot of pain and hurt in your heart. When you think about what has happened or what you may have done, the pain that the enemy brings with that will be routine or be over and over and over. Because he knows that that's one way that he can get us is to sit there and think about and dwell on the past. And it brings upon this pain. It, it, it brings inside of us just this raging fire of like, man, this is who I am. But God can't use me because of this. But how many of you guys know that our shirts that we had on Baptism Sunday in 1 Corinthians 15, 7 says that you're a new creation, that the old is gone, that when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, you're no longer uh, Eric, the, whoever it is before Jesus Christ. You are Eric, the son of God, not Jesus, son of God, but you are adopted as a son into the family of God. He washes away your sin. That he doesn't see you as who you were before, but that he sees you in the blood of Christ and that alone. That is freeing church. So it brings about pain, but the other thing that, uh, that, that happens when we dwell on the past is this. 
it automatically blocks what God wants to do for you in the future. When we dwell on the past, whether good or bad, it blocks what God wants to do in the future. Let me give you an example of a good one, because I don't want it to be all bad. In churches, oftentimes what, we, what, churches, what happens in the church is, uh, man, we had an amazing season back when. Man, God did so many great things in our church 20 or 30 years ago. And so what naturally happens in churches is that we begin to focus on the past rather than the present and the future, and it, it, it literally halts what God wants to do right there. And that's not to say that God is not a God of the past. I mean, the whole thing about the scripture is history, and he moves, and, he, and, and Paul studied the history. But what Paul says here is forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Church, if we want to be a church, if we want to mature as Christians, if you want to have a thriving life in Jesus Christ, you need to let go of the past. Let go of the past. Let go of the past hurts. Let go of the past abuses. Let go of the past um, accomplishments. Or whatever it is, lay it at the cross this morning so that Jesus can fully restore you and redeem you and then say, hey, guess what? I have a promising future for you. This is why in the book of Ephesians, Paul talks about putting on the new life. Because if all we do is dwell on the past, we stay there. Paul says, let, of, uh, let those of us uh, who are mature think this way, and if anything you think otherwise, God will review that to you also. How would you guys like that? Any of you guys who are stubborn, there's your line. That is your verse. Take it home. If you're stubborn, use it against your spouse, use it against your kids, whatever it is. I'm just joking. I'm joking. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. Paul is pretty much saying, hey, guess what? I'm right. You're wrong. Just suck it up. God will reveal it to you. But I also believe in there that Paul is talking about in order to strain for the goal, in order to continue to move forward in your faith in Jesus Christ, in order to become a light in the darkness, in order, according to be, uh, or in order to be a source to other people, it's okay to agree to disagree. It's okay to agree to disagree, but what's not okay is, uh, is to agree to disagree and say, well, Scripture says this, and take it out of context. Because what Paul's getting at, remember, in, in, in this book of Philippians, Paul is, on these last two, uh, in chapter 3, he's getting at false teachers coming into the church. He's telling people, hey, this is about to come your way, that people are going to say that you have to be ABC in order to be saved. They have to do... X, Y, Z in order to be saved. And what Paul's saying right here is, okay, I disagree with you, and uh, by the way, God's gonna make that real to you. Scripture, let those of us who are mature think this way. Everything that we believe, everything we live out, everything that we should pursue should never, ever contradict the word of God. And that's what Paul's getting at, straining towards the goal. The other thing I just want to talk about real fast before we go into communion. Join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Real fast, what he's talking about there is imitating me. Uh, in their culture, a lot of people would imitate uh, pastors or their fathers. And what he's saying is really imitate me. If you're going to look towards anyone and anyone else, look towards me because I walk out my faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. I don't put any more bondage upon you. I don't put any more weight upon you. I don't do anything that distorts the gospel. I believe in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. So imitate me and walk how I walk. But then he says, for many of whom I've 
often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. The glory is their shame. And their minds are set on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like, the, be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to the subject of all things. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my, my joy and my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord. It's a lot to unpack. Honestly, and I don't even like saying this usually, but these verses from 12 through 4, 1, we could probably spend two months on. Because if you're a theology guru, if you're someone who likes to go really deep into theology, this is loaded. This is loaded with salvation theology. And I kind of just want to wrap it up in this one way because maybe there's people here today who don't fully understand the cost. Maybe there's people here today that don't fully understand what Jesus has done. There's three stages of salvation. You have justification. Justification, salvation means that you've been justified before God because of Jesus Christ and Christ alone. That when you say, hey, I've lived my life how I want to live, I am a sinner, and I've sinned against you, God, but now I'm giving my life to you that you can restore me, that you can redeem me, that you can make me whole, that you can renew me, that you can change me and transform me. I just want to live my life for you. You've been justified before righteous, holy, just God. Justice, salvation. But for there, then you have sanctification salvation, which once you place your faith in Jesus Christ, you become sanctified through this life until you go home with God. And that's what Paul's getting at in verse 12, saying, I haven't, I haven't became perfect, but I pursue it. He's becoming sanctified to become more like Jesus Christ. And that's why oftentimes in life, you'll say, You'll hear, why do bad things happen if there's a good God? Because God is conforming us more into his image. And if everything's always hunky dory, then we would never grow in our faith. But real faith, true faith, redeeming faith comes when we go through the fiery persecution of our faith. As Michaela said, as come in this time, you are going to see ample people fall away because there is persecution coming to the church. But for those who strain towards the end and become sanctified in that process, there is a glorification salvation where our bodies become like Jesus himself. And if you guys don't understand what that means, it is amazing. It's where Jesus shows up to the, to the disciples and you have Doubting Thomas and he says, I don't really believe that's you. You don't look beaten. You don't look like you looked before we took you off the cross or they took you off the cross. You look beautiful, you're, you're glorified. And Jesus says it's him. See, through this earth, you're gonna face the trials. You're gonna go through the fire. You're gonna go through the storms. You're gonna get cuts. You're gonna get scrapes. You're gonna have nights of tears. And you're gonna have days where you just, uh, just shout for joy. Your body is going to become beaten and broken and prodded and destroyed. But because of your faith in Jesus Christ, your glorified body will be perfect. And church, that should drive us. That should drive us to tell the goodness of God. Church, that is why Paul says, I say it like this. I have told you and now tell you, even with tears, even with tears, knowing that there are people who say they believe in Jesus Christ, but there's no fruit. 
Knowing that there's people who are knowingly rejecting Jesus Christ and the goodness of God, it brings tears to my eyes. Because Paul had one mission and one mission only, and that is that God be glorified in him and through him, and that people would come to realize the goodness of Jesus Christ and what he gave. And church, I want to tell you this morning, fight the fight. Press on. Keep straining because what's going to come is way better than anything this world has to offer. When Jesus descends from the clouds and he brings his kingdom and his authority and his power and his restoration and his redeeming work, man, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Glory to you and you only, King of kings, Lord of lords, Alpha the Omega, we raise you up high. And that's what Paul is talking about. Not a short message. Not a very well put together message. But what I do know is that God wants to meet you here today. I believe it. Because I believe we have people here today who haven't placed their faith in Jesus Christ. But have placed their faith in knowing about Christ. And that's not condemnation. I believe. I believe we have people here today that have it wrong. I believe we have people here today that have placed their faith in the work that they do and not in the work that Jesus has done. I believe we have people here today that have maybe placed their faith in Jesus Christ but then abused his grace and say, I can live this way because I can just ask for forgiveness. And and I'm telling you right now that the book of Hebrews says that if you do that, if you go on willfully sinning, there no longer remains a sacrifice. That those who have tasted the goodness of God's word yet went to live a life that they've chosen to live has fallen away. And that is why I want to reflect in communion. Because this is a reflection of what Jesus has given his blood and his body, beaten, prodded, spit on, ridiculed, destroyed. For you, for you, and you, and you, for me, for every single person that's in this room, he did that. Not because he was forced, not because he was persuaded, not because he was convinced, by the authorities, but because of his genuine love for you. Show me another God. Show me another God that's done that. And church, if that doesn't compel us, if that doesn't give us Man, a brokenness that leads to completeness and joy. I don't know what we're doing here. You can stop recording, Luke.